G'day and howdy. Let's take a break from foods to visit cartoons again. Modern cartoons. With the introduction of streaming has come a whole world full of new animation. But of course, some of this animation has not been loved. Despised, in fact. Bottom rung ratings or countless angry reviews, which of these cartoons are most despised? And how do these hated cartoons fare against my list of the worst cartoons of all time from seven years ago? Which is worse, the old or the new? We'll see. Let's check out the 10 most hated modern cartoons. I'll be focusing on really modern streaming animation for this list. So cartoons from the last two to three years. Anyway, let's begin. Starting with number 10, The Patrick Show. I don't know, who is this cartoon actually aimed at? The Patrick Show is a bit like Uncle Grandpa in that every moment is complete off the wall absurdism. But hey, maybe the cartoon has some clever writing. This might be a chance for our undersea friends to spread their wings away from Bikini Bottom's status quo. But when it comes to The Patrick Show, let's start with the elephant in the room. The Patrick Show started with one big strike against it from the start that made many people dislike it. And this strike against it came after the tragic death of Steven Helmberg. According to some sources, he wasn't into the idea of a SpongeBob spin-off. We can see in an old interview with Television Business International, Steven said the original SpongeBob show was meant to be about SpongeBob and his relationships with characters. But a show about Patrick? No, that'd be quote unquote, a little too much. And interestingly, he predicted it pretty well. Much of the Patrick show reflects this sentiment, a little too much. It's like a blended mix of Uncle Grandpa and SpongeBob season six on steroids. I guess is what we get when instead of one Patrick, we have seven Patricks. The result is a constant stream of chaos and absurdism. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, but you've got to be an audience that enjoys Patrick going into strange Pee Wee Herman charades and absurdist rants all because he's hungry. So from this, it sounds like Steven wasn't too interested, but at the same time, it appears from producers' comments, he was at least aware spin-offs of SpongeBob were happening. According to a showrunner for SpongeBob and co-executive producer Vincent Waller, Steve was aware it was being developed. Sadly, he did not get to see it completed. I think it would have made him smile. According to Vincent, his friend Steve left him in charge and they spent many years trying to learn what made Steven laugh for the show. But with that said, let's get to the actual review. What's actually happening in The Patrick Show? When or where is it based? Hi, I'm Patrick Starr and I live with my parents. Yeah, the affordable housing crisis hit a lot of people hard, but I'm glad to see you're coping with it so well, Patrick. You may be asking, what happened to the rock he lived under? Well, it appears The Patrick Show happens in between Camp Coral and SpongeBob. So Patrick and SpongeBob appear to be in their teens in this show. I find a good timeline indicator is Pearl. In Camp Coral, she's barely one year old. In The Patrick Show, she appears to be a young girl. And obviously in SpongeBob, she's a teenager. So what is The Patrick Show about? Well, it's loosely about teen Patrick doing a trashy TV show from his parents' house with his sister. There really isn't anything inherently harmful or wrong with The Patrick Show. The family all gets along well and each family member seems likable enough. But I have one personal strike against the show. It's a show about Patrick the most annoying character in all of SpongeBob. Why him of all these creative characters we had to choose from? Why? They could have made a show about an undersea living scientific squirrel, a genius planktonic copepod entrepreneur, or Squidward for Pete's sake. But instead they chose the one sea animal known to have no anatomical signs of an actual brain. Why? This is my show! Ugh, I'm missing foods already. But my complaints aside, what did other people think of the show? Well, Dave, it ain't pretty. Its IMDb score averaged at three and a half stars out of 10. Let's start with the pervading thoughts among reviewers. No, just no. Boxwood Express also had some insightful thoughts on the show. Comedy reliefs don't need spin-offs. Patrick is a character best in small doses, as he's a comedy relief. Too much of those types of characters can get frustrating to watch. I find the show rather uninteresting and slow. And yeah, despite the constant insanity being thrown at us, this is what I felt too. Watching The Patrick Show, I felt frustrated and bored at the same time. They also pointed out one of the positives I liked too, which is the creative designs of the characters and the animation. 
such as the designs of Patrick's parents, Cecil and Bunny, way better than the original design of his parents from I'm With Stupid. And that's the shame of it all. There's a lot of creative potential here that kept me patiently watching through each episode. And finally, how does this deeply hated cartoon stack up against my worst cartoons of all time? Well, probably the Patrick Show's closest equivalent is ugh, Breadwinners. Buckle up, duckies, cause we got a rocket band. And yeah, no competition. I think Breadwinners is way worse. Breadwinners was everything I hated in hyperactive, obnoxious cartoons. Patrick may have absurdity, but at least I don't feel outright angry watching it. And unlike Breadwinners, I didn't see any particularly bad messages in The Patrick Show. Patrick Show's just harmless, silly fluff. So that's one point to the new versus the old. Underarm corks! <laughs> and coming in at number nine, Thundercats Roar. You know, inherently, there's nothing wrong with a spin off or a remade series. In fact, some can be quite ingenious, clever, and entertaining. But what bothers me is when a remake is an outright insult to the original series. So why this preamble, you ask? Well, let me introduce you to Thundercats Raw 2020. This scored an astonishingly bad 2.1 out of 10 on IMDb. And from the first episode, I can definitely get a good picture of why. A very ugly picture of why. Here, we don't so much have a Thundercats episode, but just this discombobulated mess of a show with little more coherence than a random string of consciousness bundled together. Scenes here reveal no clear train of thought, just a string of loud and annoying situations that are barely resolved before moving on to the next. I'm lying, oh lord of the Thundercats, and I'm swinging on a vine! Yeah! Oh! See, even if you say it's just for kids, it's not like adults have to like it, that's not completely true. Parents might have to walk by or be in the same room while kids are watching it, and parents will be the ones who remember the original. And if their kid is watching something that is insulting to the original show, they might not necessarily approve of that for their screen time. Disney's a good example of this. Parents often have to see the movies with their kids, so they have to be written with some intelligence and insight while also being entertaining to kids. That's the magic of a good kids cartoon. Anyway, the whole thing's a complete mess, and I definitely wasn't the only one who didn't care for Thundercats Raw. In researching, I found this to be one of the most unanimously hated cartoons I could find. For example, in reviews, Klingbeal said, Oh my god, this is terrible. The script on this thing is completely scatterbrained. Every situation lasts 5 to 10 seconds before moving on. My brain hurts just watching this drivel. Skuggavog also put it into perspective. They said, This is complete crap. I loved the original Thundercats, but this has no respect for the source material. It should be full of action, some humour, and look good. This is just ugly and silly. Ugly is definitely the right word, because when those characters first popped out of that capsule, my first thoughts were, it's unsightly. Why would you draw anything like that? But what are some positives we can derive from this scatterbrained, ugly junk pile? Well, personally, I think the voice acting is fine. If you close your eyes while you're watching the show, you can clearly hear the voice actors trying to give it their all and remain in these very silly characters. But once you open your eyes, the ugliness and obnoxious is overwhelming. So how does this stand up against some of the worst cartoons of all time? Probably the closest comparison I could find is number four on my list, King Star King which in recent years I've mellowed out about. Nowadays, I'd probably take it off the list. King Star King is perhaps an uglier cartoon, but the animation doesn't make me feel angry the same way Thundercats Raw did. Both are confusing and very peculiar, but with King Star King, I feel like I'm watching an enlightening insight into a person's subconscious. Thundercats Raw just felt pandering and stupid. So on this one, I'm giving a point to the old. You've shown me that Thundercats Roar is a worthy successor, and anyone who says otherwise has a poop mouth with poop opinions. Well, I guess that settles it. <sighs> of course they collaborated with Teen Titans Go. Of course they did. Let's move on. And what's at number eight? Poops. Oh. <laughs> I was bored by 12 seconds into the trailer. Gentlemen, they call us losers. They call us 
boys. Who calls us <laughs> boys? I've said it. Me and all of your parents. Oh, what do you know? Another unfunny quote-unquote adult show with edgelord brand of humor without any actual deeper substance. For this, I'd actually like to quote one of my top comments on my old Worst Cartoons video. In the top comments, Rylog said, It's almost like edgy and controversial isn't a good trait for a show. Exactly, so why do we keep seeing these appear? Just how hated was this cartoon? Hated enough that Netflix hastily cancelled it after 10 episodes. I watched the pilot on Netflix, and within the first scene, it just felt like trash. The coach, named Ben, immediately goes on an offensive tirade at the opposing coach, and then another opposing coach. Knock it off, Hopkins! Oh, you, Greg. You're the one who probably shoved the hamster up there in the first place. How has this guy even lasted five minutes as a coach? Who would pay this guy to coach anything? I wish you guys were this unified on the f court. This is a sort of drunken rambling that you'd expect to hear in the Watch House jail bars as the town drunk is sobering up for the night. Everything the coach says in this first scene makes me assume he's an obscene trash bag with no likability. And it wasn't far off. My fiance Nin actually watched a lot of hoops with me. What did you think, hon? He's got a major potty mouth and trash talks his own team. I'd quit instantly if this guy ran a team. Yeah, I think I'd quit too. This is a small list of some of the terrible things Coach does in just the pilot episode. First, he yells trash talk at the indigenous principal when she tries to calm him down. That's not an opal problem, it's a bin problem. Then just and say that, not this OPBP bullshit. I did. Second, he propositions a high school student to get them a fornication partner if they agree to become part of the team. Yuck. I am in the position of submission. What gets me is he then propositions his high school class to try and get this student a fornication partner. When that fails, he hires a prostitute which he pays for with money from his existing team. He's also incredibly nasty to his dad and his estranged wife. Not to mention refusing to sign divorce papers his wife has repeatedly asked him to. Look, until I sign the divorce papers, you're still my wife. How is that likable? That's just a cowardly scumbag move. As for IMDB reviews, you get a mixed bag on here. Some people say the show grows on you. Personally, it definitely didn't grow on me. In one review example, Blythe and Ferb says, This is a flanderized Peter Griffin as a basketball coach. Ben is a big jerk. Best thing I can say is the animation is halfway decent. One out of ten. But how does Hoops compare to the worst of the worst? I'd say the closest equivalent to Hoops on my old top ten worst cartoons list is the Drawn Together movie. But honestly, in this case, I actually prefer the Drawn Together movie. As trashy as many of the jokes were in that movie, there was way more creativity in its awfulness, and I liked the main characters way more. Yeah, there was a rocket that shot literal feces and a superhero that fell in love with a corpse, but could you honestly tell me you could predict anything that happened there? Even the end was a surprise. They left me guessing to the very last second of the show when they were erased. So on this one, I'm giving a point to the old. And for seven lucky seven, Fairview. Hey, this was executive produced by one of my favorite comedians, Stephen Colbert. How bad could it- Ooh, 4% on Rotten Tomatoes bad. We're in for a wide-scale disaster here, aren't we? In fact, so little care and effort was put into Fairview that it's theorized on IMDb that it was all a giant troll move by Stephen Colbert to make the worst show possible on a major network. And Stephen, good sir, I think you may have been successful. While I'm personally perfectly okay with a well-done political comedy, what we got here was some kind of hackneyed ripoff of South Park. And I don't actually like South Park nowadays, so I'm probably the worst possible audience for whatever brand of edginess this show was trying to go for. I mean, it's not like South Park is copyrighted simplistic animation mixed with political commentary, but the subtlety is just non-existent here. And it's the exact same shtick as South Park anyway. All the characters overreact to everything and everyone is made to look like an idiot. The only characters who look good are just the ones that don't take a side on anything here. It's just the same old, if you care about something, you're stupid shtick. Apparently only apathy is smart. So you will do nothing? Apathy is death. Worse than death, because at least a rotting corpse feeds the beasts and insects. Apathy 
is death. Anyway, you might be wondering why these characters have no legs and instead just an uncomfortably rounded butt. Well, apparently they're meant to resemble matryoshka dolls, a type of Russian doll where one is placed inside the other, each decreasing in size. Which I guess is original, but it doesn't make them any less ugly. The sad part is I understand some of the morals that Fairview is trying to get across on paper. The biggest problem is how they deliver that writing. Almost all the characters are obnoxious and for some reason can only speak in one volume, yelling. Oh, are you offended? You gotta cancel me? There's no tact here. Every moral is yelled at us with all the subtlety of a sledgehammer. As a result, regardless of what you believe, you are likely to feel insulted. As for the ratings, yep, Fairview was hated and critics tore it apart. Null Unit summed up the show quite succinctly. The writing is terrible. They rattle off attempt after attempt at something funny. But none of it is funny. MROB was somehow even less forgiving. I'd give it less than a zero if I could. IMDB wants 150 characters, but this travesty leaves me speechless. But how does Fairview compare to some of the old worst of the worsts? In this case, I don't think the worst cartoons of all time have any real equivalent to Fairview. The closest I would say would be Nutshack. Both have that in-your-face rowdy humour. I think I'd give preference to Fairview, but only just. I feel like I at least get some insight into American issues and different perspectives in Fairview, and it's at least trying to tell me something, as badly as it's doing that. While Nutshack's jokes mostly felt ugly, tasteless, and gross to me. So this point is going to the new. And coming in at number six, Camp Coral. Much like The Patrick Show, Camp Coral walked in with a lot of strikes against it, because some believe that Steven Hilberg wasn't aware of the show. But if you remember Vincent Waller's tweet from earlier, SpongeBob's showrunner and co-executive producer. Steve was aware it was being developed. Sadly, he did not get to see it completed. I think it would have made him smile. And once again, I'm more trusting of a producer of the show who is trying to honour the legacy of a passed away friend, instead of focusing on well-meaning but angry fans. So once again, let's try and focus on the show itself. Is Camp Coral a quality cartoon? Why is it hated? Well, the funny thing about Camp Coral is it just leaves me kind of devoid of emotion. While a hyper-infamous Spongebob episode might leave me annoyed and slightly nauseous, and a super funny Spongebob episode might leave me laughing out loud, Camp Coral is so inoffensive and bland in most of its jokes that I don't know how to feel about it. Though it definitely has its cute moments, like when Patrick helps Spongebob capture his first jellyfish. But overall, Camp Coral feels more about making meaningless but distracting kids animation, rather than making actual entertaining jokes or interesting character dialogue. Often in an episode, it feels like just nothing is happening. For example, in episode one, Spongebob wants to catch a jellyfish. Unfortunately, obstacles keep getting in his way that prevent him from doing this, such as getting a call from his mother. I guess it's an excuse for us to see the characters we know in the past. For example, I like seeing Mr. Krabs as a caring father instead of just his usual one-note greedy capitalist role in Spongebob. But generally, I just have no investment when nothing of substance is happening. And I have even less investment in completely child versions of the characters. A common complaint I found online was that people felt the CG animation was ugly. And yeah, I get that. This is certainly not the 3D animation budget of the third movie. As CTE said in his review, These 2D characters just don't translate well to 3D on a television budget. I mean, it's certainly not the worst 3D cartoon animation I've seen. Like, the 3D Garfield show just looked way worse. Another complaint I notice is there's no sense of it being underwater. And I definitely noticed this as well. Well, yeah, the original show didn't follow any real rules of underwater physics. Bikini Bottom still felt like it was at the bottom of the ocean, but Camp Coral never felt like it was an underwater camp in any way. They may as well have said it takes place on top of Bikini Atoll Island, because I kept forgetting it's meant to be underwater. Once again, I've given a bucket load of my own opinions and not enough of other people's opinions. How do others rate the show? Well, I'm probably one of the more favourable, forgiving reviewers of the show, yet even I'm calling it dull. CTE gave the show a 2 out of 10. 
it doesn't capture the magic of the original series because it makes all the characters children. Here, they are all watered down to younger audiences with younger personalities, and it gives the series very little to work with. The episodes don't have much of a story either. They're basically just a series of events that try to be funny, but the show's watered down, so the jokes never hit. I think CTE captures a good point here. The term watered down sums up Camp Coral quite well, despite the fact that, you know, it doesn't feel like it's underwater. Now let's see how Camp Coral compares to my top 10 worst list. And yeah, it's not even close to as bad as these. On my original 10 worst, the only thing even remotely similar to Camp Coral is Breadwinners. And I watch 10 episodes of Camp Coral any day, over half an episode of Breadwinners. Even if Camp Coral isn't good, this is an easy win for the new. I'm glad you do, Spongy. You have fun here. But personally, I think I'll keep watching you as an adult later in life. Number 5. Total Drama Rama. Ugh, I've never liked kid version spin offs of cartoons. And this was recommended multiple times by my community. Even as a kid, tiring tripe like Tom and Jerry kids and the Flintstones kids bored me to tears. But this feels more redundant than any of the stupid kid spin-offs I've seen in years. Part of the value I found in the original Total Drama was the relatability of the characters. I could relate to them as teens and adults because they felt like real people in difficult situations. So why did they remove all relatability by turning them into freaking preschoolers? And not just preschoolers, but the most hyper-squeaked, annoying kids you could possibly listen to. Just one minute into watching this, I had the makings of a migraine. We can reunite this beautiful, beautiful boy with the <laughs> And it seems we weren't the only ones who were unimpressed. When I looked for opinions on IMDb, many were left scratching their heads. For example, Bryce Harlan said, Why does this show exist? I absolutely love Total Drama, all the seasons, but not this garbage. Total Drama fans will likely feel their intelligence actively being insulted. Sean T. Johnson brings up a similar question in his review. Why does this show even exist? Total Drama has officially been ruined. I don't think it ruins the original show, it's just no reason for it to exist. The show has bad humour, no drama, and nothing about it is good. The problem is, the show's called Total Drama, and, and what in the lives of preschool kids could be so dramatic? Did they scratch their knee? Did they miss nap time? Who cares? I don't. So what say we leave Total Drama Rama to sit in the corner and think about what it's done? Exist. And what do we got for number four? Santa Incorporated. Ah, stop motion. It's such a waste when they're poorly written or they turn out bad. Because stop motion is not only exceptionally difficult and meticulous to make, but exceptionally rare. And Santa Inc. is one of the very, very rare stop motions in the last 5-10 years. It was made by Sarah Silverman and Seth Rogen, two very talented comedians and writers, but they can certainly have their dud projects too. And Santa Incorporated was seen as their combined ultimate dud. It would be an understatement to say watchers and reviewers were not impressed. In fact, on IMDb, Santa Incorporated managed a 1.7 out of 10 based on 15,000 ratings. It's hard to get across just how unanimously low the ratings have to be for a show to get that bad a score. It was titled by some reviewers, Truly a milestone in bad entertainment. Or, Possibly the worst show ever made. Jeebus, really dude? Danuta Goska went into a bit more detail in their review. Santa Incorporated is totally tone deaf. Seth Rogen and Sarah Silverman have no idea who their show is addressed to. Kids will not get into it and adults will be alienated. At least we can say it's memorable, but not in a good way. Sword Snare 4 wasn't much kinder. I'm no fan of Christmas shows and films, but this is just a lazy attempt at mocking Christmas. It's cringy and completely unwatchable. But on this one, I actually disagreed with popular opinion. 
I don't think it's trying to mock Xmas. I think it's trying to use it as a medium to talk about female or minority focused issues such as the glass ceiling. The Barbie movie recently did the same thing. Unfortunately, it's getting that message across in a much less artistic and more crass way. But from the episodes I watched, I disagree. It's among the worst. It's not good, but I actually like the dialogue here better than some of the previous titles. Like this writing is miles better than Hoops or Fairview. And there are a few jokes that actually made me laugh. More American kids believe in you than they do in vaccines or the Holocaust. That's great. I mean, disheartening for America, but great for us. But on the other hand, there were definitely some crass, trashy lines that just made me roll my eyes. And it's a good thing Prancer's not Santa because his <laughs> was as thick as a chimney. But I like the concept here. And I actually felt invested in the main character, Candy Smalls. I found the concept of her campaigning to become the first female Santa really cool. It helped me see a different perspective, and I like that. But I definitely get why it would be too crass for some viewers. And finally, how does Santa Incorporated compare to the worst cartoons of all time? None of the choices on my old worst cartoons have remotely as much effort as this had in writing, characters, or performance. Santa Incorporated may be among the most hated modern cartoons, but personally, I thought it was okay. And for number three. <laughs> We are not calling ourselves that. Seriously? High Guardian Spice. Ray, oh, I know of this creator. They also worked on another cartoon called Danger and Eggs. Unfortunately, High Guardian Spice was less well received. It received only a 1.5 out of 10 on IMDb, and it was recommended by my community for the most hated multiple times. So let's take a look what we got here. On the surface, High Guardian Spice looks perfectly fine. It's like a blend of She-Ra animation with the pastels of Steven Universe, but a bit choppier, with a strange sprinkling of Harry Potter at the top. The expressions kind of remind me of the original Teen Titans show, where Western animators are paying homage to Japanese animation. It also reminds me of the old 2000s anime I grew up with as a teen, like Dot Hack Twilight or the Ragnarok Online anime. So what the hell happened here to give it such abysmally low ratings? Allow me to answer this for you, and I'll try to keep this brief. <laughs> Keyword is try. Firstly, this show was being produced by Crunchyroll, using the finances earned from their website subscriptions, which was promised to go towards struggling animators in Japan. Seriously, these animators work 24-7 to produce anime non-stop for severely low wages. So understandably, this confused their demographic who didn't want their money to go elsewhere. Secondly, the teaser trailer announcing the project only briefly talked about the story, while focusing more on how amazing it is that their staff are mostly women. That's fine and dandy and all, but the story that was given to us sounded like every other anime under the sun. Thirdly, because of studio changes and rushed scheduling, the animation suffered significantly. And finally, the story was bland, uninteresting, and well, to sum it up all for you nicely. Let me tell you how I got my sword. It's my mom, she's my dad, and I don't give a Let me show you all my blacksmith skills and my parents, they're insane, cause I don't give a And my mom says old magic only, and my cousins are lesbians, and I don't give a And my feelings here, my feelings there, and I don't give a Well, I hope that answers your question, Strider. Now back to the video. Oh, uh, that clears up a lot, actually. Thanks, Robin. My personal problem was, I was just bored with the premise, cause I feel like I've seen it a million times before. Maybe if I was 20 years younger, new to anime and magic fantasy anime was still a new concept to me, maybe then I'd find it okay. If you've ever seen a fantasy anime, the story's one that may sound familiar to you. Four students attend the High Guardian Academy and are training to become guardians of West City. The problem is, this feels like every Japanese, Chinese, or Korean MMORPG I played in the 2000s. I think Annie Hawks brought up a good point in her review. This feels more like fan animation than actual anime. Don't get me wrong, there is nothing wrong with that. But when something this bland and pointless is made, it's an actual slap in the face to anime and manga. When I read more on the show, I noticed the team that made it had a similar policy to Danger and X. They tried to assure that both cartoons told diverse and inclusive stories. What does that mean? Well, there were a good amount of LGBT representations and diverse relationships. And that sounds great. I just found it such a shame that neither cartoon could conceptually interest me much. Ironically, High Guardian 
Italian spice was missing a little spice to it. We had some sick moves yesterday, High Guardian Spice. Rosemary, sage, parsley, and thyme are all herbs. They're not spices at all. Some reviews said it was not the inclusiveness that bothered them, but how those LGBTQ ideas were incorporated. Take Concerned Person, for example. To quote them, shows like She-Ra and the Princess of Power are great because they integrate LGBTQ ideas and acceptance casually, but this show throws it in your face." End quote. But most importantly, even if this animation was not a crowd pleaser, I hope the team behind High Guardian Spice and Danger and X don't give up. Don't let me or anyone else ever stop your creative flow. And what do we got for number two? Paradise PD. The trailer states quite proudly from the twisted minds that brought you Brickleberry. One of the most disliked cartoons I've found in the last 25 years. Why would they advertise that? That's like dropping your guts in a funeral, then proudly standing up to say, that fart was mine. And like its predecessor, Paradise PD was really disliked. In fact, the first and top comment on the trailer of Paradise PD really sums up public opinion. I feel bad for the people that animated this. Personally though, this is gonna sound crazy, but I actually kinda like Paradise PD. I thought it was funny. As crass as it can be, it actually has a good array of interesting, funny characters. I pulled over a suspicious looking colored fella. <laughs> I think these characters are actually likeable. Personally, I think this is a big improvement from Brickleberry. In the crew, we get the crack-addicted sniffer dog, a traditionally beautiful lady cop who is crushing on the big cop. I memorized all of Wikipedia instead of having friends. Oh my god, that is so hot. Go her! And just a friendly African-American cop into yoga. Hell, they randomly hire a hobo cop along the way. It's a surprisingly diverse, interesting cast. And I found the voice actors to be really charismatic and energized, and obviously loving their roles. I'd say the main cop character is an example of an obnoxious character like Ben from Hoops, but actually done charmingly. And frankly, this is another show where I never know what's going to happen next. And yeah, the scenes and dialogue will give you some nasty surprises, but they'll give you some funny surprises too. But what do other people think? Why is there so much hate behind this show? Well, understandably, I think there's a moment in the show that turned a lot of critics to the point of no return. And unfortunately, it's in the very first scene in the very start of the series. And if you're a dude, it's one of the cringiest, grossest jokes possible. We see Chief Crawford get his two veg shot off by his son. Ugh. But if you can put this extreme gross out moment aside, the rest of the series has some legitimately clever writing and funny moments. <laughs> Chief, you know that's your car, right? Nin and I sat down to watch this together, and we both laughed a lot. Our main complaint was similar to many critics. There's a lot of recycled two veg and butt jokes. Seriously, by episode two, a lot of butt jokes. So I do get some of the hate, as there's very crass humor here. But these characters were so likable to me that I could mostly tolerate it. But I'm curious about what other people say about such a notorious show. Let's start with a review from Generations of Wine. From the people that brought you Brickleberry, we have yet another cartoon with a good premise. One that starts off fine and then slowly falls apart as starts to think it's funnier than it actually is. And what does MG Legends say? This is not funny at all. All the characters are the token idiot. This is such a bad show. One out of ten. Yeah, let's agree to disagree on this one, because personally, I got a lot of laughs, and I don't think this show takes itself too seriously. And of course, how does this show compare to the worst of the worst? Probably the closest equivalent on the list is the American Dad episode American Fung and the Family Guy episode Brian's a Bad Father. Once again, I much prefer the new in this case. I'd watched the entire season of Paradise PD before I rewatched American Fung or Brian's a Bad Father again. Those old episodes infuriated me. Paradise PD had me pleasantly surprised. And for the last and very possibly least, number one. Jinkies. Jinkies? Why are you saying jinkies? Is this like when you tried to make Keep It Frosty a thing? Velma, season one. 
And I can almost guarantee you there will never be a season two. Yes, very sad. Anyway. For I have never, ever met anyone who actually likes this cartoon, ever. My therapist knows more about Velma than anyone that I've ever met. Velma. <laughs> if you've heard of Velma, there's a very good chance you've heard how much people hate this cartoon. They just loathe this thing. If there's ever been one thing our society has been united in, it's our seemingly universal hate for the cartoon Velma. It's almost like the show actively insulting every possible audience they have is a bad idea. When I watched the trailer, I didn't crack a smile once. I just cringe knowing I'd actually have to watch through some of these groaners. If there is one thing the internet agrees on, it's that you should never change anything ever. I hope you die. The only time I smirked was when I saw the highest rated comment on the trailer. I don't think I've ever hated something this much. That's very telling. Let's keep this simple. Let's just look at a random review on Rotten Tomatoes with its audience score of 7%. Not a good start. Let's start with Alexandra. I don't understand people scoring more than one star for this show. It's rude, racist, offensive for the sake of being offensive. The character is solving case because of the luck and not because she clever or competent. Pretty sure that the most poor written TV show. Well, despite English clearly not being their first language, Alexandra's review does reflect a lot of other reviews. I wanted to go into Velma judging it as objectively as possible, so I wanted both Nin and myself to give our opinions on this. Let's start with Nin's first reactions to it. This show is mean and it feels in bad taste. Very bad taste. My first problem was the show is so revoltingly arrogant and self-congratulatory. It's just so proud of itself. Even the way it so proudly points out how meta it's being by putting the gratuitous shower scene in the pilot. And I can't even appreciate the animation here because every character has this beady-eyed scowl like they're speaking condescendingly to you. Um, the only hook a good show ever needs is good storytelling. And then we notice the show is speaking down and insulting its audience in multiple jokes. You know what 420 is, right? Um, yeah, it's code for adults who still watch cartoons. Who says that? It certainly didn't win them any credits. And how, how does a show manage to make every single character so vehemently unlikable? I don't like Velma, I don't like Daphne, I definitely don't like Fred. Each character is constantly snarking and sniping at each other. This is a world where no friendships or relationships are portrayed. Just passive aggressive quips at each other for a cheap laugh. Now you have Gigi to talk about boring stuff like your swords and feelings. The writers seem to have forgotten if they make every single character supremely unlikable, well, no one's gonna wanna watch them. In fact, there was a point where Nin and I literally had to stop watching to take a break because watching the show was just making us too angry. We needed something decent to watch after to just wash the crappy taste from our mouth. Now, normally I don't mind a show referencing political issues. For a show to be political or aka to have a message, I don't think that's a bad thing. It shows passion from the writers. But the writing in this show is some of the most spiteful I've ever heard in a cartoon. Anyway, let's head into the minefield that is the reviews of this show. Personally, I wanted to get a good feel for what many women thought of this show, since there is a lot of ladies in the show. And on Rotten Tomatoes, we got a good perspective from multiple genders. I think Heather Hogan gave a very concise review. Every episode is a cringy, eye-rolling slog that doesn't seem to have any idea who its audience is, yet seems to despise them all the same. I really agree. That unwavering hatred the show seems to have for the viewer is overwhelming. I think Shirley gave an interesting perspective too. Like a certain Mystery Incorporated member rummaging around in the dark for her glasses, the series is unfocused, confused and desperately lost. The world of Velma may make some people mad, but really, it's just sad. No people in the world of Velma have any real human warmth or connection with one another. There's no affinity, no one seems to actively care about other people. The few relationships I saw were momentary physical ones with no actual affinity or care for one another. And Velma as a character doesn't have any self-respect. 
She's rude, exhaustingly nihilistic, and seems to just hate everyone. And the show seems to be so proud of itself for portraying this boring world and boring character, as though it's saying something deeply thoughtful. So how does this compare to the worst cartoons of all time? Well, congratulations are in order for this cartoon. Velma officially gets the title that only the worst of the worst gets. It is Rotten. It stands toe to toe with giant crap holes like Ren and Stimpy adult party cartoon. While not as repulsive to watch as that show, Velma creates a steaming pile of a world that is equally or more infuriating to watch. That is one big pile of shit. In fact, I think we should delete a point to the new just for Velma's existence. But hey, the new still beats the old. And if you think I missed a particularly hated modern cartoon, feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments below. And as always, what? thanks for watching and hope to see you next time. Today's member question is from Patsy L. Pardon my voice, by the way, I'm getting over a cold. They ask, what is a song Nin and I both love? I sound so stuffy. Patsy and their husband like Time Is Running Out by Muse. Our favorite is probably For You by Rita Ora. As hilariously bad as Fifty Shades Freed might have been, I think For You is the best thing that came out of that movie. An absolutely beautiful song. 